This is the Brave New Coin Crypto Conversation, hosted by Andy Pickering. Hi everyone, Andy Pickering here. I'm your host and welcome to the Crypto Conversation, a Brave New Coin podcast where we talk to the people building the future in the Bitcoin, blockchain and cryptocurrency space. Hello everyone, Andy Pickering here and we have a very good show for you today. But before we get into it, need to shout out our new sponsor, Nexo. Yes indeed, are you ready to grow your wealth with the world's leading digital assets institution, Nexo? Well, you should be ready because you can earn up to 12% on your digital assets with Nexo's high yield savings account. That's right. So treat yourself, uh, treat your crypto and treat your fiat with the industry's best crypto and fiat services, which include compounding interest paid out daily. Uh, there are 18 available cryptocurrencies, including Bitcoin, Ethereum, Litecoin, various stable coins and many more. And three fiat currencies are accepted, the euro, the pound and USD. And Nexo has up to $375 million worth of insurance across all custodial assets. Top-ups and withdrawals are available at any time and there are zero fees for using the Nexo Earn Suite. So... Are you ready to start earning? Of course you are. Simply go to nexo.io and of course that is spelt N-E-X-O dot I-O. And now it's on with the show. My guest today is Simona Pop. Simona is Head of Community at Status or Status, however you want to say it. It is a secure messaging platform that also functions as a crypto wallet and Web3 browser. Hey, very interesting, very cool sounding. Welcome to the show, Simona. Thank you so much for um, having me on and um, great to be here. It is great to have you here. So look, looking forward to learning more about the status platform today. I have had a, a little look and yeah, I, I like what I see. But before we do that, let's learn a little bit about you, Simona. Uh, I'd, I'd love it if you could just introduce yourself to the listeners. Give us a, a little bit of your background, uh, your crypto story, whatever you'd like to share. Please go for it. Absolutely. Well, so in terms of my journey in, it's, it's very classic. I think um, we all kind of go through that moment of discovering crypto, then kind of thinking, hey, this is pretty cool, and then immediately going down the rabbit hole and never coming back. Um, and it's pretty much the same um, happened to me around um, 2014. I kind of started looking at Bitcoin, thinking about and looking at uh, cryptocurrencies as a real interesting potential in the way finance could change and the way um, you know the the flows of value could change but let's face it at the time I was also um, doing a little bit of, of investing and then kind of life got in the way and normal web two things started you know, easing their way back into uh, into focus until uh, 2017 when I really started getting into ethereum and Again, having that same feeling, but this time almost 100x, because this kind of uh, possibility of building things on top of uh, a chain and really, really getting to redesign the way things work was incredibly, incredibly appealing. And it's it's one of the reasons why I immediately kind of thought, yep, I need to get involved in this now. Um, and so at the beginning of 2018, I co-founded uh, a project called the Bounties Network, creators of the standard bounty, bounties protocol. Um, for those of you who may not have heard of Bounties Network, um, Gitcoin, is a platform that initially their bounty offering sat on top, was built on top of the standard bounties protocol. Um, and the whole kind of flow of everything that I have done since has always been from bounties into getting involved uh, with a lot, a lot of uh, projects in this ecosystem and really looking at how we can gain that adoption and gain that ability to 
have effects and affect the real world um, has has always been what I've been interested in, what I've been passionate about. And it's one of the reasons why I've worked on things like um, partnerships with UNICEF, working on scholarship programs around DEF CON, which is uh, the uh, biggest Ethereum event um, in the in the uh, crypto space uh, around different hackathons and educating newcomers and finding ways in which we can essentially incentivize and, and uh, coordinate that onboarding flow into uh, crypto for a lot of people. And, and a lot of people, regardless of their region, regardless of uh, the language they speak, regardless of whether or not they have a technical background. And it's one of the reasons why now with status, it's something that's very important for me because it is a uh, an application that is mobile first, which means that it appeals and suddenly becomes accessible to a much, much broader population, um, which is again, one of the, the kind of overarching themes in my uh, crypto story, I always want to make sure that that access is as easy as it can be, as smooth as it can be, barriers removed so that we can genuinely uh, redesign and reshape the way things work. Fantastic, fantastic. Okay, well, look, interesting that you, you raised, uh, you know, working with UNICEF and and I guess kind of, you know, human rights initiatives like that. And I can see there's, you know, uh, on on uh, the Status website, you know, you talk about how uh, Status strives to be a secure uh, communication tool that upholds human rights. So I'm, I'm sure uh, there's there's some more you've you've got to say there and, and we'll get there very soon. But I think before we do that, Simona, uh, it's probably useful at this point if you kind of just, you know, give us um, your uh, your elevator pitch or, or your overview of, you know, how you uh, describe uh, status and, and, and what, what it's all about and, and what are the, I guess, the goals of the project. Mm -hmm. So I think for me, the easiest way to encapsulate everything it does is it's a gateway to Ethereum or a gateway to crypto. The reason why I define it that way, and, and also we'll, we'll chat about the, um, as we're kind of progressing the project, we'll chat about um, the things that I'm excited about where we're heading. But in terms of this gateway um, kind of illustration or, or uh, definition, I think it's it's a very rare uh, project that essentially does very three very distinct but incredibly important things in one application in one place, um, and that is it's a wallet, it's a private messenger, and a Web three browser. Now, normally when you think about those things, you usually have to use two, three, if not four, different applications. The reason why it's powerful is because all of those things exist in one place. And again, as I mentioned, it is mobile first, which means that you can do a lot of the crypto native flows in this one application. One of the challenges with crypto onboarding generally, and again, since 2017, I've kind of seen this, and we're getting better as a, you know, as a, as an industry, as a technology. But it is challenging. You are introducing so many new concepts. You are introducing so many new um, applications and ways of doing things for people, particularly in that very, very crucial onboarding stage. That you kind of want everything to be in one place so that it's okay. Download this. And then you can access this, 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 and this. So it's a doorway that is a door flung open for you that you can then have the ability to access exchanges, to access uh, crypto art marketplaces, to access uh, oracles, to access games, to access everything that essentially crypto has to offer from that singular point of entry, which again is something very, very appealing, particularly when you are doing this from your mobile phone. 
there's a lot of stuff out there that is a mobile optimized, even though I have been ranting about this again for years, uh, that we must optimize for a, for a mobile experience. But it is something that um, essentially, I would say, turbocharges your, your journey a little bit and also does it on that privacy and decentralized layered goodness. So you're not only getting this kind of you know, gateway in, but you're also doing it in, uh, you know, in a privacy protecting, in a decentralized fashion, which is at the end of the day, completely in line with uh, the the Ethereum ethos and also in line with our principles. Well, Simona, maybe um, a good comparison to make here would be MetaMask, right? Simply, and I and I, I simply say that because obviously, you know, you'll be very aware that that is how um, a lot of people interact with Ethereum, right? So may, maybe for for people who aren't familiar with with status, just just give us a, a little bit of uh, an idea of what is possible uh, through. Uh, status that obviously you can't do with MetaMask and, and uh, yeah, what, whatever other differences might be uh, applicable here? I wouldn't necessarily um, kind of do it in a this does more, one does more than the other. They are kind of different because the wallet piece is one element of status. And so with MetaMask, it is just a wallet. Right, and of course, it has the extension. Then, then um, it can can uh, help you navigate uh, and explore uh, crypto applications. The journey is very interesting. So, let me give you a little bit of history. Um, MetaMask obviously started as a desktop first um, wallet, and then moved to mobile. And I believe it was 2019, maybe when they when they came out with with a mobile wallet. Now, what that means is initially, because most of the users were developers, the desktop first experience was much more appealing. You needed the desktop experience to essentially uh, build a lot of the, the applications that we now see. Um, and of course, it is incredibly, an incredibly, incredibly valuable piece of um, you know, uh, crypto accessibility, um, MetaMask that is. And so the journey that they took was desktop first and then they moved to mobile. What we did was started with mobile and now developing the desktop piece. So we kind of did it the other way around, which obviously meant that for a lot of people, the their first experience with a crypto wallet will be MetaMask just because of the desktop um, kind of experience. And then, of course, when MetaMask launched mobile, a lot of people who just had a desktop, um, the desktop MetaMask as a wallet just naturally uh, moved to, to the mobile counterpart, which makes complete sense. So I wouldn't necessarily see in terms of um, in terms of feature parity, it's pretty much there. Um, it, they do a, a lot of well, all of the same things. Uh, all I will say is that on uh, mobile, obviously, the experience of switching uh, between networks was uh, and is a lot easier on status. So it's a very simple uh, switch, but I think uh, by now I think MetaMask has also made it a, a lot, a lot easier than it used to be um, to to join a bespoke network. So I think it's not necessarily again this is better than the other. It's just the wallet piece is one component of what Status does, and it is the main thing that that MetaMask does. Sure. Sure. And look, listeners, if you're um, if you're starting to uh, you know get really curious as to uh, uh, what status looks like and how you can start using it, uh, hearing Simona talk about it, simply, uh, you know, the link will be in the show notes, but just go to status.im and, uh, and yeah, everything that you need will be there. Um, but so Simona, look, I uh, mentioned before, so I think on your website, it says that status strives to be a secure communication tool that upholds human rights designed to enable the free flow of information, protect the right to private, secure conversations and promote the sovereignty 
of individuals so yeah i mean this is i i, I love the language here it's you know that it, it's it speaks to the the core i guess of the the crypto ethos so yeah tell us tell us why this is so important uh, to uh, you and the team so i think the whole team and obviously um our our founders when when they created uh, the, the project, it's incredibly important to realize and bring back into the, uh, I guess, the the day-to-day consciousness of people that actually your privacy is your right. Um, and we've been kind of educated for so long that giving it away is the way you get things and is the way you get access and is the way you can tap into the digital world. Um, and I think it's it's very, well, it's high time we not only have the conversation that your privacy is your right, but this is the time to claim it back. Um, and I think, you know, where I believe we're at the beginning of that journey, just not just with crypto, but in with this consciousness of what is your human right? What does that mean? What does data that you are constantly leaching out into the world just because it gives you access to things the way Web2 has has educated us and almost kind of in a Pavlovian way has taught us to expect that the reward comes with the giving away of rights that uh, we need to to completely unlearn and we need to completely reverse. Um, and I think, you know, like you rightly said, crypto is all about that, is all about, uh, you know, shifting that conversation from power to empowerment. I think we are switching the conversation and switching the, the way individuals and communities uh, see themselves and understand that who they are and what they're doing and how they're communicating and what they're communicating is incredibly valuable, but it is valuable for not for the monetization that existing Web2 platforms have have kind of uh, taught us or, or certainly have put in place um, for that communication, but it is valuable because of what it contains, it is valuable because uh, it should not be censored. It is valuable because uh, it is something that belongs to to us, to us as individuals and to us as a collective and not uh, corporations. And so this is why it's so important for people to come back to that level of understanding. And I think this is one of the things that we are very conscious of. And, and we see the people joining status it's what they care about for a variety of reasons, right? Um, I often say privacy right now is an active choice. It's not easy uh, to, to claim it back, right? Because we've given so much away. Um, and so when you give so much away, it's hard to, to claim it back. And like I say, it's, but it is an important impulse that makes people want to, to use status because it helps them restore it and it helps them protect it. Yeah, fantastic stuff. And and mm. look, y- y- you're right. It is it is hard for people to, I guess, uh, claim that privacy back. But I think, you know, uh, there's so many examples of this. Uh, you know, right back to Edward Snowden's uh, original uh, revelations. And while there was, uh, you know, quite an outcry at the time, I think. You know, this it just shows that for so many mainstream internet users, as long as they can get their uh, their free access to you know <laughs> the, their Google Suite and their and their Facebook friends and uh, and their YouTube yep. videos, um, they're, uh, they're a lot of people are aware of the the data trade offs now, but not necessarily aware enough to care to make the switch. But it doesn't, mm-hmm. you know, at least at least we are building the decentralized web. Web three is coming up around people, and and eventually. Um, yeah, it'll, it'll just be easier for, for people to make that switch and it'll make more sense to them, right? You know, the way I look at it is we are building a choice for people. Right now, 
in terms of privacy, in terms of um, you know financial flows, in terms of how uh, we uh, transact value, and that value is multifaceted. I don't just mean money. Um, we don't have a choice right now. Well, certainly, people in Web two do not have a choice. They can move from here to here, but it's the m much of a muchness. We are right now building a true choice for people to opt into and come to the to the Web three side when they are ready. And I completely and fully understand some people will be earlier, uh, let's say, Web three citizens um, versus um, compared to others. And that's absolutely fine because at the end of the day, each individual, each community has that choice. And for me, that is what Web3 is all about. It is about having a choice. Yes, indeed. And and you guys, uh, I guess you uh, walk the walk, or uh, as the expression goes, mm -hmm. and, and that you guys, are, I, I, as I understand it, you're uh, an entirely open source project, and yes. well, it's, it's, it's not uncommon to have a, a remote, decentralized um, uh, series of teams that are all over the world, but um, I, uh, that's, uh, that's how you guys operate? Exactly. Exactly. And I think it's, again, it's one of those concepts that for a lot of people, but actually for a lot of people, maybe back in, again, 2017, 2018, it would have seemed like something out of the ordinary. Fast forward two, three years later, where everybody has been working from wherever they are, suddenly you kind of go, hey, <laughs> this is actually not that crazy of a concept. Um, and so I think, again, it comes back to that valuing the individual and what they're, uh, you know, what they bring to the table. That is the most important thing versus where they're located, uh, whether they're in a place from this hour, hour to this hour. We understand that productivity, you know, is different and, and hours of productivity are different for, for different people. And we also understand that people enjoy working in their own rhythm. I think, again, if you focus on what is important for individuals and communities to thrive rather than abide by a very strict regimented um, kind of a plan that is a one fits all um, style of approach, I think it's, it's time to shift that. <laughs> Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, let's. Uh, I want to talk a little bit, just briefly, about uh, NFTs, uh, crypto art, you know, memes, mm -hmm. um, and and all that good stuff. Because I can see that uh, I just had a, a little look at your Twitter, and I can see that you're you're deep into, uh, <laughs> you know, the the NFT community and the meme communities, and and fantastic. But just before we do that, so I think I, I saw that also you've been hosting workshops in Latin America. And this is this is to do with mm. NFTs as well, right? So maybe that's kind of a, a nice segue uh, for us to, to, to get there. But so, yeah, what's this about? What were you guys doing in Latin America? So I think Latin America is, is an incredibly, incredibly um, important region, not just generally in the world, but I think in terms of um, crypto use, what we have seen around the different countries in Latin America is that real desire for change and that real interest in getting involved. Um, Ethereum itself has in an incredibly and has had a long an incredibly powerful history of um, uh, an Argentinian uh, community that really, you know, spawned a lot of uh, great people into the ecosystem. Um, they work around all of the main projects in the ecosystem. And I think it comes from that uh, desire for change because the current system in most of those countries is just not working for the broad population. It just isn't something that, again, is conducive to a thriving uh, environment or a, a thriving socioeconomical dynamic. So for us with Latin America, we've always been, and I've personally been very conscious of the fact that everything tends to be in English. 
um, when it comes to documentation, when it comes to educational efforts, when it comes to onboarding efforts. And so we really wanted to focus on the fact that edu um, producing educational content, educational workshops, and onboarding newcomers from Latin America into uh, the ecosystem was an incredibly, incredibly important uh, endeavor. And it was also very much in line with the mobile usage in those areas. So it's incredibly important to, again, link what ex what is um, what happens in a region with what is accessible and also what it what the potential is and what the interest is. And for Latin America, all of those things were kind of all suggesting to us that that we have to be there and we have to support people on their journey into crypto. And so um, what we've been doing a lot of have been workshops, not just around NFTs, but around DeFi as well. NFTs, um, we have this uh, kind of initiative called Crypto Atelier. We've done a lot of workshops, particularly around Colombia, um, with ambassadors on the ground and uh, uh, core contributors on the ground, which has been incredibly, incredibly powerful because it is leading us towards um, creating programs that will support artist journey into the ecosystem. I can't divulge too much about what that means right now, but uh, it's, it's coming, an announcement is coming. But essentially the whole idea around it is how do we very simply and very, um, in a very meaningful way, get an artist who is curious about NFTs to a place where they are not only on a platform, uh, on a marketplace, but set up with NFTs minted, with uh, potentially a uh, you know a successful gallery and um, a, kind of a stepping into the uh, the crypto art space and the crypto art community. So that's a lot of what we've been doing. And now we're working to expand that into Brazil. Um, we have a few artists already queued up for, for Brazil to essentially, again, start creating this uh, space where people can learn, people can ask questions, people can uh, get support uh, potentially with uh, in their minting process, in their journey into crypto art and what it means and what maybe our best practices and uh, where to find help and uh, how we can um, support them on that journey. So it's, it's a very, very important piece, I feel, and it is something that we continue continuously think about how can we improve this? How can we make this easier? How can we make this more accessible? How can we make it so that this crypto initiation process, if you will, is a very, very pleasant um, and, and easily, uh, you know, easy to navigate, essentially, for anyone. Sure, sure. And well, th thank you for explaining all that, Simona. And look, I, I said we'd talk more about, well, I'd love to hear, I guess, you know, your, mm -hmm. from your personal perspective, right? So on, on your Twitter, you say, say that you're an art collector, I, I assume that you're, uh, you mean digital art and, and NFTs. And you also say that you <laughs> are an inverse meme aficionado. So well, let's start with that. Uh, what's an inverse meme? <laughs> I essentially started looking for, I, and I'm sure everybody is familiar with the typical memes that kind of circulate in the space. Um, I'm sure everybody yep. has seen the usual ones of a man explaining something to a uh, vacant looking woman. Yes. Um, and so what I've done is I have gone and hunted down the inverse photo of that, i.e. a woman. It, and it's if you know the meme I mean, you know exactly what I'm referring to. It's that same girl explaining something to a vacant, to that guy wow. looking vacant. I love so, it. So, yeah. 
and I think that's important because, um, and, and there's a few of those um, that, again, if you will look at my Twitter, you will see what I mean. I think it's incredibly important to make sure that everybody is represented um, in this space. And also, again, because we are moving from this um, the existing dynamics and from um, and into this movement of empowerment of individuals, I think it's very important to, again, ensure that it is a varied um, space that it, it illustrates. So our memes illustrate the fact that it is an incredibly varied, incredibly um, you know, diverse space. Um, and I think it's important for us to, to transmit that through memes. So uh, if ever you find inverse memes or uh, let's say the, the complete opposite to a meme that you've, uh, that you've seen, send it over because I will um, Photoshop that and put it out into the ether as they say. <laughs> Brilliant. I love it. Very nicely said, Simona. Uh, I'm, I'm glad that you've made that a, a project and I'm, I'm going to, I'm following you on Twitter and I'm going to keep an eye <laughs> on uh, your inverse uh, meme collection. Um, look, let's just begin to finish off uh, this part of the podcast. Look, anything else uh, you want to share on, you know, crypto social communities, uh, your work mm. at status or, or um, yeah, a- anything else, uh, please, please. Absolutely. It. Absolutely. So um, I think it's incredibly, incredibly important um, for us to, to continuously evolve and improve on what we're doing. And so with um, Status, it's, it's time for us to really bring all of those ingredients that we already have, the wallet, the, the communication piece, the chat, and the browser into supporting this idea of or, or what you might call crypto social. What I mean by crypto social is essentially a space that enables communities to not only maximize what they are doing in terms of how they engage, how they, uh, again, um, uh, transact value and how they explore the digital uh, space, but doing so in that on that layer of privacy and decentralization goodness. I keep saying this, but I think it's incredibly important for us to not just, again, because we walk the walk, uh, and I'm a big, big, big fan of that versus talking the talk, I think it's incredibly important for our Web3 communities to exist within Web3 community spaces. And so, what we're working on right now, and I'm incredibly, incredibly excited to, to kind of spearhead that is this community's feature within status where you basically have all of the ingredients there uh, um, essentially working to enable crypto native flows in terms of access to communities, in terms of token economics, in terms of um, pieces of vital kind of uh, DAO, which are decentralized um, organization, autonomous organizations, uh, like voting and all of these dynamics happening natively within a Web3 application. Because right now, a lot of the, um, the, the Web3 communities exist on Web2 applications. Um, and they usually handle a lot of the, the crypto flows through bots, through kind of makeshift um, style uh, uh, dynamics. And I think it's incredibly, incredibly important for us to evolve and for us to create that space where, again, communities can find that, that uh, ability to do all of this um, in, a, in a native way. Well, so that's where we're moving and that's what we're moving towards. And that's what my hope is. That is what we can offer, not just existing communities, of course, but the new communities that will uh, emerge in the crypto space, the new communities that will move from Web 2 into Web 3 and so on. And again, very, very importantly, make sure that that journey is a uh, let's say a five-star one, a pleasurable one. Um, and so we're going to be doing uh, a lot of uh, UX improvements as well. Um, not 
uh, just to, to the app in itself, but to the wallet piece, to the chat piece, so that, again, we can make sure that it is an environment that benefits from the uh, privacy and decentralization, but isn't uh, hindered by some of the, the pitfalls of uh, censorship-resistant tech, which can be spam and things like that, um, which, again, is, is a very, very big um, consideration for us. Brilliant. Well, I can do nothing but wish you and the team uh, the very best as uh, you pursue your endeavours, Simona. Uh, look, let's go to a very quick break and then we will come back and we will finish off with the very famous Crypto Conversation Hot Take Ground. Grow your wealth with the world's leading digital assets institution, Nexo. Earn up to 12% on your digital assets with Nexo's high yield savings account. Treat yourself, your crypto and fiat with the industry best crypto and fiat services featuring compounding interest paid out daily, 18 available cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin, Ethereum, Litecoin, stablecoins and more. Three fiat currencies are accepted, Euro, Pounds and USD up to 375 million insurance on all custodial assets, top-ups and withdrawals available at any time, and zero fees for using Nexo EarnSuite. Start earning at nexo.io. That's nexo.io. All right, we're back and I'm with Simona Pop. Uh, Simona is Head of Community at Status, the secure messaging platform uh, that also works as a crypto wallet and a Web3 browser or your uh, your gateway to the wonderful world of Ethereum. And look, Simona, I like to finish each podcast with a quick round of rapid fire crypto conversation hot takes. Are you up for it? Let's do it. Let's do it. All right, Simona, I just want your hot takes, quick snappy answers. Here we go. Uh, where do you sit on the Bitcoin maximalist to multi-coin opportunist spectrum? Um, I am definitely on um, the multi is better. I do not like uh, an obtuse or a narrow view of things. So I will always try to consider um, a multitude of uh, solutions, but definitely make sure that we focus on um, the ones that make more sense and the ones that will actually get us to where we want to go. Good answer, Simona. Good answer. Hard, hard to argue with that. All right. Well, what would you say is your firmest conviction, crypto opinion? Oh, um, I think I've kind of touched on this, um, but two things. I think it's incredibly important um, to understand that what crypto enables for us all is a choice. Um, what that means will be incredibly, incredibly personal to um, everybody, um, but it enables that choice and that is important. And also I believe that it levels out the playing field in terms of access to resource, which again will have a very broad gradient in what that means, but it is an important, important uh element of it as well accessibility is key all right i love it uh, here's a curveball for you simona uh, ubi as a potential fix for either you know ai induced automation or uh, you know a p- potential fix for you know wealth inequality in, in the future ubi good idea or no um, I think I've been part of two um, or participated in uh, or participating in two UBI projects. I think it's important to experiment and I think it's important to not just draw conclusions based on um, empirical data and things that we um, haven't really uh, explored. And so I am willing to explore things first and then draw the conclusions after that experimentation. It's incredibly important to, again, make sure that you test before you just produce some text saying yay or nay. That makes sense to me. Okay, well, uh, Bill Gates famously said that we tend to overestimate what we can accomplish in two years and underestimate what we can accomplish in 10. So look, go for gold, Web3. Uh, what does it look like in 10 years time? Hopefully it's where we'll all be. 
Um, right now, I feel for for a lot of people, um, they're obviously the broad population is still in the the Web two boat. We have a few people in the Web two point five boat, uh, and and um, few are still in the fully in the Web three boat. I feel um, we will absolutely if we continue to move at the pace of. Uh, building at the pace of innovation, at the pace of enthusiasm, at the pace of creativity, at the pace of onboarding that we have currently been tracking. I think we're well on our way to get there. Um, I think it's incredibly, also incredibly important to make sure that we do not just focus on short-term goals, which to me is what the Bill Gates thing um, kind of means in my mind. Um, the long-term uh, goals and the long-term vision is incredibly important and it's incredibly important for us to stay the course. I think you will have seen the meme in it for the tech um, whenever prices drop. I think it's important to make sure that we keep that build and we keep uh, moving towards where we're, we're aiming for and not get distracted by those short-term uh, blips, by the short-term wins, by the short-term whatever it may be, but keep the eye on the prize, which is moving from Web 2 into Web 3 and everything that that means in terms of empowering individuals and communities for better, for a dynamic of thriving versus mindless growth. I love it. I love it. Always zoom out. All right. Well, uh, look, on a slightly similar note, uh, Simona, uh, William Gibson said that the future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed. You'll be very familiar with this quote. Uh, But can you think of an example of the future being here right now, but most people just are not aware of it? I think it's a very simple example um, that I'll give and um, I'll actually send you the link um, so you can maybe put it in in the notes. Um, I published a story, um, maybe it was two, three weeks ago, um, about a community member of ours um, back from Bounties Network days um, who um, used to be homeless and now has just, um, you know, got his uh, own apartment. Um, last month or two months ago. And he managed to get there by not only tapping into the crypto ecosystem, but using crypto applications and uh, being able to, to um, you know, use crypto as an income. So use it for, uh, you know, day-to-day needs. And I think this is already happening and it's already possible i think for a lot of people they are just not aware of how much is there and it's incredibly incredibly easy to use i think because we and and a a lot of people look a lot of people around me just my you know non-crypto friends i think it seems like something far into the future when in fact it's happening right now and it's happening with incredibly incredible life-changing effects for the people who are willing and who are ready to take that step in and it is testament to the power of this technology and what we are all doing here that it can take you from uh you know an a that isn't supported by current models to a b that enables you to not only be a part of uh the web3 society but also be part of the web3 economy very nicely said again simona all right let's start to wrap this up uh finally what is your favorite science fiction book film show or universe there's so many i mean now that you told me about the universe i'm kind of immediately you see this what being in web 3 um it does to you i just immediately thought crypto voxels (laughs) and remembered that i just got uh some wearables in my um open sea earlier this morning so um i think look from my perspective um it's it's what we're building right now and i would love for more people to start getting involved to see what 
we can build together. And I think that's the type of universe that I'm really into. Um, and I'll also, um, oh, if I can remember the title of this, because it is by Simone de la Rouvière, who has been a big part of the crypto ecosystem for a very long time. Um, he's essentially been around for years and years and years, um, working in the NFT space particularly, and he wrote a book called Hope Runners of Gridlock. Um, and I'll also send you the link um, so that you can maybe uh, put it in, in the show notes, but it's essentially kind of a cyberpunk novel that also comes with um, some extras when you purchase it and so on. He also did a, an incredible dynamic of um, essentially um, letting people pay whatever they thought uh, it was worth. So a really, really interesting take on publishing, a really uh, great novel. So I highly encourage uh, people to read it and experience it. Yeah, fascinating. That sounds really interesting. I, I, I'm just looking at it uh, on Amazon now. And uh, so, yeah, I would be excited to investigate that a little bit more. Hope runners of a gridlock indeed. All right. Well, look, this has been a lot of fun, actually, Simona. I've really enjoyed talking to you. So thank you for coming on the show. There's, there's nothing else to say, really, except to hand uh, the microphone metaphorically back to your good self and look please tell the people where they can go to find you on on twitter and, and any other platforms that you're on and where they should go to to dig into uh, status and, and what you guys are building absolutely so thank you so so much andy um for for um having me on the show it's been a great great way to to um spend the morning <laughs> for me with a cup of coffee chatting about my favorite things yes um <laughs> so obviously everybody um can find me on um on twitter i'm at sim underscore pop and then of course in status so go to status.im download um the application and you will find me um in status um just again at simona pop um, you can use ZNS names in there as well. Um, and that's how you'll recognize me. So just search for my username and then also just, you know, come be part of this community, ask any questions. Um, there are no, uh, you know, crazy questions or dumb questions. It's a place that is welcoming to everybody. Everybody is very, very keen to make sure that we kind of um, have a very uh, accessible, again, um, way of, of doing things. So join us, ask your questions, um, and come explore Web3 with us. Brilliant. Hey, thank you so much for your time, Simona. Uh, all the best, and bye for now. Thanks, Andy. Bye, everyone. All right, guys. Uh, thank you very much for listening. Uh, yeah, that's today's show. Don't forget to subscribe to The Crypto Conversation in whatever a podcast app you are using. And if you want to get at me, just drop me an email, andy at bravenewcoin.com. All right, thanks for listening, guys. This was The Crypto Conversation for...